Hello everyone and welcome to Managerial Accounting. In Chapter 18 we're going to talk about some introductory concepts in Managerial Accounting, essentially what Managerial Accounting is, and we're also going to talk a bit about how manufacturing firms differ from service firms and retail firms when it comes to keeping records. So what is Managerial Accounting? In the simplest way possible, Managerial Accounting is a form of accounting which focuses on providing useful information to internal decision makers, the management of the company. This differs from financial accounting because financial accounting is centered around providing useful information to external decision makers, so your investors or lenders that you want to get a loan from. Managerial accounting in this way uh, has a little bit of a different emphasis, namely that we are going to not be tied so much to procedure, to the things that we have to do, but more about keeping the best records we possibly can so it helps our company prosper. Here are a list of differences between financial accounting and managerial accounting. As I stated before, the main difference is the primary user of your information. For financial accounting, it's purely external, while managerial accounting, it's internal. Uh, the third line down, focused and time dimension, is a very important one. In financial accounting, it is by nature backwards looking, meaning that we are going to look into the past and see what happened, what kind of income did we have last year, how did the value of our business change from the actual results that happened last year, uh, and you know, what did we owe, what did we own, etc. again when last year ended. For managerial accounting, we're not going to be backwards looking anymore, we're going to be forwards thinking. Essentially what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a plan and we're going to decide this is what we think is going to happen during the upcoming year. Uh, and we're going to say we expect it to cost this much, we expect that if we do this we're going to generate this much income. So we're going to move our attention away from uh, record keeping as much as budgeting is going to be our big emphasis coming up. Rules and restrictions, and this is a huge difference between financial accounting and managerial accounting because the information used in financial accounting is provided to external decision makers. You fall under government oversight. You have to adhere to the generally accepted accounting principles. There is a set way that you have to prepare every document, that you have to prepare every journal entry that you record. For managerial accounting, because the only people that are ever going to see the information are inside of the company itself, no one outside of the company is ever going to see it, you're not stuck by gap guidelines. So you are free to account any way that you possibly can think of as long as it's the best way, in your opinion, to make your company prosper. Uh, the scope is also going to change as well. No one in financial accounting, uh, no investor, ever wants to see a very detailed log of every little thing that you did during the period in regards to your inventory, etc. They just want to know the numbers at the end of the period. So there's summary reports. For managerial accounting, reports get much more detailed because a manager will care what times you have to purchase inventory at. Uh, they will care you know, if one territory is more profitable than another territory. So the scope of the information gets much more detailed under managerial accounting. In managerial accounting, we're always going to keep our mind on the fact that responsibility flows up in an organization. And by that, I mean there are certain aspects of the business that each have their own manager. Starting at the bottom of this chart, there's a payroll processing manager, a production manager, and a sales manager. They have their own individual aspects of the business to look over, and they're responsible for keeping oversight on the accountants that are tracking numbers for their particular area of business. But there's people above them. So that information that they compile flows up to another higher level manager who usually gets information from multiple different managers in order to you know run their section so for the tablet computer section of here there's just own manager and underneath it falls the production manager and the sales manager both of those managers have to flow their information upwards to the tablet computer manager and they have another division uh, second line from the bottom farthest to the right the software development division that will have its own manager but both of those are part of operations. So both of those managers will have information that flows up to the COO, the Chief Operating Officer, which will then flow up from there to the CEO. So in a company, 
there's always, unless you're the president, there's always someone a step ahead of you. And even if you are the president, you have the board of directors to report to. So information flows up in an organization. There's not one person that can do all of the different aspects of keeping track of a manufacturing company. It's just too much. So they delegate out responsibility so each sub-manager, if you will, has their own little area to keep track of. And from there, the information just keeps going up all the way to the top of the company. There are these three phases that we are going to talk about extensively in the beginning of this course, and they are planning, directing, and controlling. It is the cycle that every managerial, or sorry, every manufacturing company goes through. In fact, any company that does anything will go through the same cycle. The planning step is coming up with a guideline for what you expect to have happen during the next year. Uh, or the next couple of years. So it falls into two different categories. There is strategic planning. That is the long-term goals of your business to open up operations in a new part of the world that you've never done business in before. To launch a new subdivision that makes a type of product that you've never had before. Those are all really, really long-term goals. You just can't do that in a couple of months. So that's strategic planning. The day-to-day, -day, the things that you normally do, that falls underneath operational planning but both of those aspects before they you know dip their toes in the water if you will they are going to make sure that they have a really strong guideline plan in place before they even begin to make sure does this make sense for our company to do and if they like that plan if they like that guideline they're gonna direct operations essentially making sure that everything that's happening within the company is following that guideline that they sent forth when they planned and as they're directing their way through, some things are going to go according to plan. And like everything in life, some things aren't going to go according to plan. And those things that don't go according to plan, well, you can't have that. You need to find a way to, you know, better your operations. And that is the controlling step. So essentially, in the, career, in the controlling step, it's going back and looking at what actually happened during your day-to-day -day operations, how it differs from your plan, and coming up with some kind of way to better your company, to make it more efficient and to make it more profitable. A big difference that we are going to have this semester is we're going to be focusing a lot on manufacturing firms. And the difference for that is, is all companies provide something to the public uh, in order to make money. They either provide a service or they sell goods. Service companies have fairly easy books to keep for. They don't have a whole lot of steps going on. They have the employee salary rate, the cost of the materials they need, that would be the cost that they have of their business, but there's not anything to do with inventory. They don't sell inventory at all. And for merchandising companies, all they do is resell inventory, which means they get those goods from someone else who made them, they mark them up, they sell them to the public, and they make their profit. But when you're a manufacturing company, you have to keep track of your own cost of production, how much you paid to make those goods which you're later going to resell to merchandisers. And when costs come in to managerial accounting, in this case for a manufacturing firm, what the cost of the goods is, is or sorry, what the value of your inventory is, goods is, is the cost that you've paid to produce it. So things like the materials that you need to manufacture those goods, the labor that you pay your employees to make them, and any overhead costs of production, which are costs which are directly related to manufacturing, which aren't the materials or the labor. So things like rent, utilities, depreciation of manufacturing equipment, etc. Those are all the costs that we're going to have as production that are going to go into our inventory. And speaking of inventory for manufacturing firms, uh, there is you wouldn't get a lot of information if you just said inventory because someone inside the company who's looking at these documents is going to be like, that's great, we have this much inventory, but how much of it is sellable? How, I mean, do we have you know goods that we're working on right now that we have a bunch of costs tied up into, but it's not in a sellable condition? Is that inventory that we're talking about, not stuff that we haven't even started using in production yet, a bunch of lumber sitting around, etc. So I have a birdhouse on the side. Uh, let's assume that this company here is going to make birdhouses for the sake of keeping things simple. The first thing they're going to need is wood. And if they said inventory and the management is deciding how fast they're going to be able to convert things to cash, well, not really. They're not a lumberyard. They make birdhouses. 
So that isn't, you know, a type of, that's not the same type of inventory as that finished birdhouse. We need to denote that when we're using this for information, that that inventory that we have is not anywhere near done being processed. And they call that raw materials inventory. It's the base level materials that you need to start the manufacturing of a product. And as you're working on stuff, you're going to have costs that are incurred in the production of those goods. But you might not finish them. Uh, and that is what work and process inventory is. It's the costs that are already committed to a product which you are manufacturing, which is not yet complete. And then once you actually finish it, well, that would be finished goods inventory. So manufacturing companies have three different subcategories of inventory, and they're all based on how complete those goods are because if you're making a plan for things that you need to pay cash for in the future if you have a bunch of finished goods inventory you should be able to convert that to cash pretty quickly by selling it but if you have a bunch of raw materials inventory well then you gotta go through the whole process of manufacturing it and I have a birdhouse in this example which is really fast to turn around and sell but what if you're making yachts what if you're building houses those things take months and months to make uh, so you can't just say inventory, you have to break it down in classes on how close it is to actually being in a sellable condition. When we keep track of costs that go into the production of goods, they get broken down into two different categories. They are direct costs and they are indirect costs. And the key thing to think about here to determine if it's direct or indirect is, is it traceable to a product? And I have a coffee cup on the side, let's say that you're a coffee house, and what cost would you have that you know would go into each and every cup of coffee that you sold? Well, the coffee, the water, the cream, the sugar, the product, the package that comes in the cup, the lid, etc. All of those are directly traceable to production of the goods. But that coffee company is still going to have costs which they can't trace, like their rent. How do you know how much rent would go, go into each you know cup of coffee? You have to pay the rent to make your product, to make that coffee, uh, but you can't, you know... Just assume that all the rent was caused by this one particular cup of coffee. You need to find some way to spread it out because it's not traceable. It's what they call an indirect cost. The same thing is true for the people that run the business that don't actually produce the coffee besides the baristas. They're going to have some kind of manager on staff at the time. Well, how much of that manager's salary is attributable to one type of coffee versus another. There's no easy way to know that. They can't say, well, I had to yell at this guy and he was making cappuccino, so let's put my cost for this hour in a cappuccino. It's like keeping records for that would be insanely difficult. Uh, so a production manager in this case is always an indirect cost. They're necessary for the business to operate, but they don't directly work on the products, which means you need to have some kind of way to spread out the cost of their salary to all of the different products that your company makes. And with that in mind, the cost of production for a manufacturing company fall into three different categories. They are your direct materials. Again, those are the materials used in production which you can directly trace to each good that you make. You know what materials went into making a certain job or product versus what materials went into making a different job or product. Same thing with direct labor. Uh, when you're, say you're a home builder and you have five different houses that are in various stages of completion, you're going to send a contractor out there to start building the house. You're going to know exactly what house that person is working on. That's very traceable. That is a direct labor cost, so you can assign that easily to products. And the last thing is manufacturing overhead, and that's all of those indirect costs. So in manufacturing overhead, if there's no easy way for you to trace a job to a particular product, you pool it, and then you remove the costs that went into that pool and spread them out in some fair way amongst all the different jobs or products that you were doing. Things that would go in there, the, the word indirect is a dead giveaway. It goes into your manufacturing overhead pool. So indirect materials are materials that are necessary for production, which can't be directly traced to each and every job. And I think of screws. Uh, if you had boxes and boxes of screws sitting around and you're building a house, does anybody want to count how